we are between, really between two different reactions. People who are trying to go back and people who are trying to discover what the future could be. What doesn't work anymore is the present for anybody. And that way is the aftermath time. Manuel Castells is socioloog en oprichter van het Aftermath Network. In het komend kwartier bekijkt hij de financiële crisis vanuit een sociologisch perspectief. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. Well, um, the Aftermath Network came from the combination of this. Uh, thinking about what could be uh, in terms of a crisis of a of a new dimension uh, with uh, an initiative that didn't come from me but from the Gulbenkian Foundation one of the most interesting and, uh, and um, entrepreneurial foundations in Europe based in, in Lisbon that approached me to ask me if I would have any uh, innovative or interesting project that I would be interested in leading in complete and intellectual independence and uh, with uh, some of the key scholars and, and researchers in the world. And then I saw that was a good possibility of combining my increasing concern uh, on and the uh, crisis and, and rather than just concentrating on specific descriptions of the crisis, which are very important and have to be done, but trying to analyze more deeply the cultural causes and consequences of the crisis. And by cultural causes and consequences, I mean uh, how the crisis is the expression of a particular way of thinking that has uh, been prevalent in institutions, financial institutions, and governments for a long time. And the consequences in terms of how to go out of the crisis, a previous thing has to be to think differently. More of the same model will go into the same consequences. But this, rather than having a pure philosophical inquiry on the matter, I uh, wanted to bring together research capacity and diverse expertise, and that's how the network of uh, very leading intellectuals and researchers in the world from different cultures and different um, traditions and disciplines uh, was created to meet once a year in Lisbon, do some research, uh, do a lot of thinking, and then ultimately uh, produce a, a comprehensive analysis of the cultural roots of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the aftermath is fundamentally uh, the aftermath of the end of a particular model of a speculative capitalism, what I call informational capital, because it uses information technologies very deeply, uh, which on the one hand brought prosperity to people's life, but also transformed their perception of life in terms that they could live forever consuming and borrowing to consume without thinking too much about who would pay for it. Uh, and the same thing for the banks and the same thing for the government. So the era of easy credit, the era of living on debt and enjoying the moment, the carpe diem of the economy has ended. So this is the aftermath of carpe diem. For millions of people in Europe and North America, the economic crisis that unfolded since 2008 has shaken the foundations of their lives. Suddenly, employment became uncertain. Credit was restricted to a few. Consumption reduced to the essentials. Social services deeply cut. And a dark cloud engulfed the future of their children reversing the pattern of higher expectations for the next generation. Well, there were signs of this already by 2007. Uh, there would, had been in the United States uh, several financial uh, bankruptcies, which were important and were immediately covered up by the federal government and, and bailing out financial institutions. But clearly, that has been an accelerating movement since the mid of, of 2007. And because I have been working for quite a long time on the um, 
non-sustainability of the model of financial capitalism in the information age because it's accelerated by technology and mathematical models, I, I started to, to follow these uh, early signs. The crisis did not come as a surprise for those who did not expect much improvement in their lives from what they labeled capitalism, a shorthand expression for the dominant social and economic organization. Not only they did not trust the facade of stability of a system submitted to recurrent crisis, but they rejected its basic principles. They objected to the destructive pace of life, to the nonsense of working relentlessly to have enough money to consume meaningless goods and services, eat chemical food, drug themselves, and compete with their human fellows in an increasingly aggressive world. One of the problems with this crisis is that has been denied again and again, uh, was financial, but then suddenly was not only financial, uh, became industrial, became a crisis of employment, and then became a fiscal crisis, and then a government crisis, and then a European crisis. So all this evolution of the crisis, what we in some of our papers call the metamorphosis of the crisis, and required uh, analytical work, deep analytical work in real time to have any usefulness. And we tried to innovate uh, out of necessity to understand the crisis in very different terms. Uh, now, how, uh, how people who, how, how useful is this? But simply, um, the formulas, the policies, the strategies to go out of the crisis have failed one after another. The only one that has somewhat succeeded is to bail out the banks. So, but for, for everything else, uh, precisely among other things, because the banks were bailed out and therefore the government got broke and therefore they didn't have money, and then the bank did not uh, return the favor by uh, lending to them, uh, all the other policies uh, are uh, blind policies uh, because this, this is a wrong analysis about what's going on. People think exclusively in short-term economic terms, and they don't think in social terms, and a crisis is social. A, a crisis depends what ultimately people react ultimately how governments relate to the financial institutions, to the civil society, uh, to the political system, to the needs of people, ultimately is a social process, a cultural process, and a political process. If you don't understand that, a few technical formulas will save the day for a few months, but will continue to go into deeper and deeper crisis, and ultimately people will block any uh, way out of the crisis. And we are already seeing in Europe very serious signs of this because um, as if people uh, consider that saving the banks but not saving the health system, not, not saving the education, not saving their jobs, uh, it's the way out of the crisis, it will be uh, increasingly tremendous tensions in the socio-political systems. And therefore, uh, an economic crisis that becomes a, an institutional crisis and then becomes a social crisis requires a comprehensive social thinking and not simply a few economic formulas. Fundamentally, this crisis has been about the destruction of the solidarity mechanism that we're establishing in society, because ultimately that's what the welfare state is, uh, to establish solidarity so that when uh, some people are more hit than others, then through the redistribution mechanism, then uh, people still are covered by society. And also, um, <coughs> but at the same time, um, the, the, there has been in the last 20 years an increasing individualization of society. People see themselves as individuals. So th the social institutions were the solidarity networks. Solidarity among people was dissolved, uh, or largely dissolved. Um, under such circumstances, when this, the institutions of solidarity are not able to operate anymore, and when individuals don't have the cultural bound of solidarity and recognizing each other as, as being together in some form, then there is not only an economic crisis, but it's a crisis of society. It's a crisis of everybody against everybody. So it's, a, it's psychological, 
but at the same time has structural effects. And it's psychological, but comes from the fact of the dissolution of the institutions of solidarity. So unless there is a reconstruction of solidarity ties and solidarity networks in cultural terms, social terms, rather than institutional terms, we go toward an individualization of society, increasing aggressiveness, and also increasing destructive competition uh, uh, between nation states that, uh, fortunately, at this point, will not lead to war, as it was in the past, but will certainly lead to the disappearance of any common project of living together in Europe at the moment when Europe is becoming marginal in the world. Uh, there is, it is a crisis. It is a crisis in, in economic terms, but the crisis, uh, it, uh, in fact, uh, has been used uh, to improve the uh, power and the profits of the financial uh, groups, which are, in fact, the leading elite in our society. Uh, all the major banks and financial institutions in the last year have reported extraordinary profits. But now the governments are in a fiscal crisis. The government need the money, and the banks say, well, in order to be uh, stable, in order to uh, not to go back into our trouble, uh, we cannot lend it to you. And in fact, the only way we are going to lend something to someone, in, if you start cutting wages, uh, firing workers, uh, curtailing social rights, and eliminating the, the collective bargaining power of the unions. So in that sense, the trick part of the statement um, seems to be empirically supported because profits are hugely up. Uh, some of the Spanish banks have reported the largest profits in history uh, in, in, in 2010. And at the same time, the, the condition had been created for an assault on the welfare state, on social rights, on the on labor union pa power, and in fact on all the institutions that were uh, uh, constructing people's life uh, in terms of, the, of their basic needs. So um, if it is, I, I don't think it's necessarily a conspiracy of the capitalist class to organize this, but ultimately, is being used in those terms. So in the perception of people, this is obviously a trick. Well, we started from the notion of the sense of an ending in terms of the different socioeconomic forms of, of the European and North American societies. That was the beginning of the project. And, uh, Throughout the analysis and the reflection that we have conducted over the last three years, what has appeared is that there is in fact a beginning. This is an aftermath. But this beginning can be interpreted, seen from very different perspectives. And we do not have a unified perspective. We never wanted to have a unified perspective, which in the current situation, in fact, would be damaging because we don't want to have another coherent discourse that would be the Washington Consensus or, or the, the Lisbon Agenda, exactly now going to the Lisbon Consensus. No, what we wanted is to open up these issues and from people who are both uh, honest and intellectually very capable to try to provide different perspective and establish dialogue, establish a bridge of intellectual interaction between these people so that the plural debate that emerges from this project could be material for people uh, in Europe and in the world at large to reflect upon. So we are providing the stimulus and some of the material for this reflection. Rather than closing the debate, we open the debate. Rather than ending, we try to be part of a new beginning. And my point is that Europe is in a process of social turmoil that is going to be increasingly radicalized in the coming few years, months and years. Um, in this process, uh, if there's no a development of hopeful movements, it will be a development of hatred movements. And therefore, the, the confrontation between the culture of hope and the culture of destructive nostalgia is probably the most important trend in the aftermath of the crisis.